Father, we come before you, and on this Father's Day, I pray that you would make, Father, our time together, Lord, uh, effective, effectual, because we're asking for you to give us insight and very simple, but yet very powerful statement, Lord God, that you have given us insight into. Thank you, Father, as we celebrate all the fathers, and we celebrate just everyone that's joined us together, because we're all focused on you. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for being, Father, our Father, that has brought us into new life through your son christ jesus and by the power of the holy spirit and everyone said amen all right from first samuel chapter one verse one an interesting verse i mean you know i like those every now and then now there was a certain man and we say a certain man of ramathim zophim of the mountains of ephraim and his name was elkanah the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, a son, a son of Zuf and Ephraimite. Now, I want to share this because I find this to be absolutely fascinating, and we're going to come from a different bent here this morning. I want to share with you what's centered around a fascinating story of one man. Most have never heard nor have studied this one man. I would even dare to say that most of you don't even know who he is, and up to this point have really not cared because you don't even know who he's connected to. You know, and the reason is because there are some people in the Bible who when you read uh, uh, about their lives, their lives just step out of the pages of the Bible in a huge and bold way. You know, I can think of, for example, David, and then there's, there's Moses, and then there's Daniel, and the list goes on and on, and Elijah, you know, and they were known for, you know, parting the Red Sea, or, or maybe slaying a giant, or, you know, or doing some kind of uh, powerful miracle, and the list goes on and on. And then there are people, like, in the Bible, like Elkanah, like, he's, you know, unfamous, you know, he has not really been heard of. He's unspectacular. He's not outstanding. He's unsensational. But there he is. He seems like an ordinary man who is a, really not a high-profile kind of guy. And yet, as you're going to see, yet, when he shows up, he has this massive impact on the world, on this earth, with his family and in the kingdom of God carries out the purposes like you wouldn't imagine. And yet there's not much said about him. So before I get into what I'm going to be sharing with you, there are four thoughts I want you to, to consider. Number one would be there are some things in life that never need repair, just absolutely never need repair. Things like, for example, the sun. The sun's always going to rise and uh, like the ocean, I don't think you're ever going to go to the edge of the water here, living on the islands, and all of a sudden find the Pacific Ocean empty of water. I don't think. Or the, the axis by which the world rotates on. So the stars and the, you know, and uh, the moon, they're already set in their course by God. Then there, number two, there are some things that cannot be repaired. Sometimes things just happen in life. And you can't repair them. I mean, you know, you, you can't undo them. You, you can't get them back. For example, when you spill the milk, the milk is spilled. All you can do is clean it up. Can I have an amen? amen. Been there. Anyways, or, you, you know, or let's just say time. You might be frustrated, might even hate the fact that you, you wasted time, you lost hours, but you can't get them back. It does you no good to get, you know, to work, to get anxious, because you can't get that time back. The only thing you can do with the time that you have left is to make it better. All right. Then number three, there are some things that if given a chance, they can repair themselves. This is really important. And I want to take a real simple look at this. And it's like, remember growing up, at least in my neighborhood, you know, the little girls, little guys, we just didn't get along together. I mean, because, you know, they said, the girls, we had cooties you know, and or we had germs, and uh, yeah, you're right, we did pick our nose and do all kinds of stuff like that, you know, and, uh, but if, if you just leave it alone, you know, it repairs itself. Isn't it interesting when they're young and they, they couldn't stand each other, because one played with dolls, the other played with G.I. Joes, 
you know, and, and, uh, and we just didn't like our environment. And all of a sudden they grow up and things start getting repaired. All of a sudden the hormones start kicking in. Puberty starts coming up. Come on, somebody. Something mysterious begins to happen. It's almost supernatural. <laughs> yeah. In fact, I heard one little boy who used to have a, uh, an attitude about little girls uh, later on in life. He wrote, um, he said, kisses have germs and uh, germs are hated. Kiss me, baby. I'm vaccinated. You know? <laughs> it's really bad. Um, uh, and there's one more. And lastly, there, there, are, there, <laughs> there, are, there are some things in life that just go from bad to worse unless God repairs them. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. So there's this man by the name of Elkanah. You know, he's a no-name kind of guy. He's not a famous individual. Again, he's unspectacular. And basically, the Bible simply points him out. If you read it, you probably read this several times in one way or another. Elkanah is only known for being um, Hannah's husband. He is basically just known as, this is Hannah's husband. And Hannah was a very important Bible character that everyone seems to talk about. But I want to give you a different perspective here today. You see... Normally in, in scripture, you cannot understand scripture if you don't try to understand what's called context and environment. It gives you a lot of insight if you just slow down and try to understand the context and the environment of a situation. Like you've seen those guys that, that um, what they do in life is they make these little ships and put them in these bottles and you kind of like, you know, what kind of tweeters, what kind of tools did you do to do that? They show you, and they, you know, whatever they do. Now, if I came up to you and said, look what I've done, you know, I, I, I made this little bottle in a ship. Number one, you'd probably scratch your head and say, well, Pastor, I think you have too much time on you, uh, on, you know, on hand. But, but secondly, if I put it in some kind of context, and, you know, and I said, but did you know that I did it blindfolded? You said, wow, really? Context matters. And then I said, not only that, I did it blindfolded and I was on a roller coaster. Oh, now context really matters, right? That doesn't happen. But anyways, um, the point I'm trying to share is like, for example, you talk about a David and you say, you know, he killed a man and you say, oh, okay, that's, you know, throughout the Bible. And there's a, oh, wait, wait a minute. But uh, put it in context. He didn't do it with an M M16. You know, he did it with a slingshot. Context matters. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And he wasn't just some ordinary guy. He was a giant. He was a giant with a titanium suit. Come on, context matters. I don't know about the titanium, but anyways. So all of a sudden, you begin to add a little bit to it, context in the environment, and it just, all of a sudden it becomes a lot more richer. So in First Samuel chapter one, so I say that to give you some context of what I'm about to share with you. So in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 1, now there was a certain man. Remember, context matters. It says now. That refers to timing, meaning that the writer is about, wants you to understand the context and the environment that, an am, that a man by the name of Elkanah steps into. This is very important. So what kind of environment does Elkanah step into? Well, you need to understand in that setting, there was no king in Israel, which basically meant there was no authority. There was no law. There was no order. I'm not talking about the episodes on television, law and order, but I'm talking about there was no, sorry, bad joke. It's Father's Day. Give me a break. Anyways, so, you know, at that time, every man did what they wanted to do, chose what they wanted to do, decided what they wanted to do. See, there was no moral authority. There was really no legal authority, no ethical authority, no one standard and uh, so whatever you wanted to do, whatever you thought was right, you know, that's what a person would do on his own accord. So this is the kind of world that this guy by the name of Elkanah stepped into, was born into. Now to understand the word Elkanah, the word El, e, uh, E-L, always is a reference to a God plus some kind of character of God. Put it together, you have the person's name. Elohim, or El Shaddai. You know, you get to understand it. So we have El, which is God, and then you have Kana, 
And Cana means to be purchased or to be possessed. So you have a God-purchased man or a God-possessed man. Ah, now context and environment matter. Are you hearing me? I'm building towards something. So it's important that you have to understand, here comes this God-possessed man, this God-purchased man, this God-possessed man, and he steps into an environment that, you know, there is no authority, there's no king, there are no moral value, there's no real biblical standard, and this God-possessed, God-purchased man steps into that world. Now that's what's going on on the outside in society. Now, for more context that matters, what's going on on the inside? Oh, I'm glad you asked the question. And the question is, when I say inside, meaning the church and ministry in that hour. Well, there was a priest, his name was Eli. You probably heard about him. Still in 1 Samuel, this is all in 1 Samuel chapter one and two, basically right there. And Eli was the high priest at that time over Israel. But the Bible says in a descriptive way that he was fat and that he was blind. I'm not trying to be rude. It's a descriptive way because fat refers to flesh out of control. He was out of control in his flesh. He had gone carnal even though he was once the great prophet of God. And he was blind, which means that he, he lost his vision, not only physically, but he lost his vision for God. He lost his vision for the purposes of God. And he lost his vision for the plan of God, the ways of God for his generation. And so that's what's going on on top of that, because although Eli was the priest, he was not God possessed. He ended up having two children, one by the name of Hophini and the other one by the name of Phineas and they were of the most corrupt nature in fact the Bible says they knew not God yet they were serving in the house of God wow you know the Bible refers to that they did not know God nor did they know his God's ways meaning they didn't pray to God they didn't worship God they didn't surrender themselves to God they didn't really serve God nor did they seek God as a matter of fact, they would twist the scriptures and they would convince the worshipers that were coming with one intention, uh, for example, women, and they twist the scriptures and they end up laying with them in the church house. I mean, we're talking about lust and adultery in the church house by the two sons of Eli because Eli lost his God-possessed identity, and even though they were religious, and even though they were going through ministry rituals, they themselves were not God-possessed. Do you understand the context? It matters, it really matters. And so you need to understand what's going on here. And uh, so I could only imagine that the kind of stuff that they would end up teaching would be twisted because they didn't study, they weren't accurate, and it was just, just too, two clowns, two bozos, you know, showing up every, every Sunday morning. And, um, but here there was this guy by the name of Elkanah. And in 1 Samuel chapter 1, what you begin to see is Elkanah was very faithful. He would constantly go up and make sacrifices to God, not just on a yearly basis, but on a weekly basis. I mean, he'd pack up his family and he'd go to church. Let me just put it that way so you would understand what I'm saying. I mean, he was just faithful. Year after year, the scripture says, he would go to church. And this is Alcana. He's living in this very troubled environment. It's very corrupt. It's fleshly. It's lost, their, the church has lost their God vision. Um, the priests are corrupt. The world is corrupt. It's carnal. There are no laws. Everybody's materialistic. They're worshiping idols. They're self-possessed, self-consumed, self-engrossed, self-centered, ungodly environment. And here comes Elkanah, and he steps right into it as a God-possessed man. Now, you know, here, but what holds them together is that he is just faithful, just faithful in the midst of trouble and so this is what's important for us to understand now when it says a certain man shows up you kind of understand context and environment now this is leading somewhere because most time when people talk about hannah it's all about hannah 
So hold on to your banana. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. It's Father's Day. I'm working it. Marquis told me to try it. Anyways, so not only is there trouble outside in society, there's trouble inside in the church house, yet he's very faithful. On top of that, there's trouble in his home. What do you mean? He married two wives. I want to suggest you not do that. You know, he had two wives at the same time. <laughs> and uh, one of them, her name was uh, Pen uh, Peninel, 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 excuse me. And she's the one who had children. And then there was Hannah, and she did not have any children. But Peninel was a very scornful, for some reason, individual. The Bible said that she provoked Hannah severely to make her miserable. In other words, she would mock her why she didn't have children and she would make fun of her and tease her and ridicule her and put her down. I have children and you don't. Can imagine what was going on. The Bible says she provoked, or in other words, she caused drama. That's the Hebrew word. No, that's not true. That caused drama in the house. And here is Elkanah, a God-possessed man, there's trouble in the city, there's trouble in the church, and he goes home, and there's trouble in the house. But you have to understand what's holding him together. He's a God-possessed man. So he's right in the middle of the whole thing, and here is Elkanah, a God-possessed man, in the middle of all this trouble, trouble in the home, Trouble outside, trouble inside, trouble with the wives, probably trouble with the children. You know, nothing's going right in society. Everything's to be wrong. But he was born for such a time as this. I'm working towards something. I'm just laying the foundation. See, you need to understand, all God really needs is one man possessed of God to change everything you men I'm talking to you on a Father's Day Sunday morning to show you your position in your generation see Alcana his key is that he was faithful year after year he went to the temple to worship and what he offered, even though it was mishandled by the priesthood he was faithful because everything he did he did unto God. And so he would bring his sacrifices. And those two priests would mishandle it. And year after year, though, Alcana kept going to church. And the kids say, why are we going to church? I don't like those two guys. They weird me out every time they look at me. You know, uh, you know and it was having, he was having problems in the home. Why are we going to church? Society doesn't seem to be changing. Why are we going to church? You know, these pastors seem to be so goofy and flaky. They don't even know what they're talking about. Why are we going to church? Because he was committed and he was faithful and he knew that if he just stayed with it, the God he was possessed by would turn something around so he had to hold on to the very little rule that he had called faithfulness. It's a good thing that you come to church, men. It's a good thing that you show up. It's a good thing that when somebody in your family doesn't want to come because they don't think they connect, you say, we're going to go anyway because God has a divine appointment for us. He's going to show up in you. He's going to show up on me, and he's going to show up. We might not have everything together yet, but if we keep going, the God who has possessed us will possess you and turn everything in our family and in society. Well, can I have an amen in the house? So Alcana remained faithful, he remained loyal, he remained committed, he would not quit because of trouble, he would not give up because of trouble, he would not throw in the towel because of trouble, he would not throw in the towel because he heard gossip of this priest or gossip of that person or sister so-and-so over here, you know, looked at them kind of funny. He was faithful to God, he was faithful to the house of God because Alcana was a God possessed man. Do we have any of those men in the house today? Give the Lord a great big hand clap. Not only did he dis display this before Hannah and the entire family, but see, being God possessed meant that he had God possessed character. You see, he saw Hannah's pain. He realized that Hannah was hurting and he loved Hannah, the scriptures say. So 
Elkanah gave Hannah a double portion of everything. He wanted to relieve her. He gave her twice. He gave her, he gave her a double the amount when it came to meals and things like that. And, and um, Elkanah says, I, I love you, Hannah. I love you. And at one point, you know, he even says, am I not better than ten sons to you? See, he was trying to do what he could to change her situation. But there are some things, some things that cannot be changed by a husband. Some things that cannot be changed by money. Some things that cannot be changed by materials. Some things that cannot be changed by titles. Some things that cannot be changed by someone else's whims. And I want you to understand, some things just get from bad to worse unless God gets in there and fixes it. You see, you gotta realize, listen to me, brothers and sisters, there was something that Hannah could not deny. There was something that she could not turn away from is that she had married a God-possessed man. The only thing that was possessing Hannah was depression. The only thing that she was possessed by was anxiety. The only thing that she was possessed by was not being fulfilled. The only thing that she was possessed by was not being happy. The only thing that was possessing her is misery. And I want you to understand there are some things that, as I said a moment ago, just go from bad to worse until God gets in there and fixes it. You just gotta realize there are times that your preacher can't fix it. There are times that your pastor can't fix it. There are times that a counselor cannot fix it. There are times that money cannot fix it. There are times that a promotion cannot fix it. What you just need to do is go to the altar and let God fix it because he's the only one who can fix all things. And so Hannah had, you know, a God-possessed man, but listen to me now. But she herself, at one point, was not God-possessed. You see, she was walking and living with a God-possessed husband and a God-possessed man. So she saw that whether there was trouble outside in society, he was still God-possessed faithful. Whether there was trouble inside the church house, he was still God-possessed. You know, whether there was trouble in the family, he still maintained his God-possessed faithfulness. Or there was trouble with the children, he still maintained his God-possessed faithfulness. You know, you need to understand that although Hannah had this God-possessed man, there are certain things that someone cannot do for you that you must do for yourself. And that's what Hannah had to do, have an encounter with God. She had not had an encounter with God, my friends. And sometimes we overread this because we don't understand context and environment. And so, you know, the only thing, as I said a moment ago, that was possessing her was, you know, depression and dejection and rejection and sorrow and misery. And everything that, you know, Elkanah, out of his love, tried to do for Hannah was not working. You know, it was never enough. Because, you know, she would just get overwhelmed. She would, you know, one time, reading the Bible, the first chapter, they were, they were having their sacrificial meal. They were eating in the house, and she just began to weep. So she walks out and goes to the temple there. I'm kind of shortening the story. Goes to the temple there and, and begins to sit down, finds a place, probably falls down to her knees, and begins to ask God, to intercede God as she had never done it before. See, that's normally where the story starts. That's where all of you start when it comes to Hannah. But without, without context and environment, how did she get there? There was a God-possessed man. Listen, I want you to get a hold of this. You know, so she finds, so she falls on her knees and Hannah begins to cry out to God as she had never done before, ever. And all of a sudden, she prayed as she never prayed before. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 1, and she was in bitterness of soul, and she prayed to the Lord and wept 
uh, in anguish, which means she just wept greatly and loudly and strongly. Then she made a vow. She came to a point in her life that she had never come to before to consecrate her life, to say, God, I'm going to make a vow with you. I'm going to make a covenant with you. She was talking to God. She says, God, I have your audience. I have the audience of one, and I want you to hear my cry, oh God. But it came out differently. She wasn't just like, I got 30 seconds for you, God. If you don't answer me, I got to get on my Instagram to see what's up. I got to get on my text messages. I got to check my emails. No, she dug in and she dug hard. Where did she get that? A God-possessed man was in her life. Not some wimpy, spineless, cowardly, I don't want to speak up about the standards of our house kind of a man, but a man that would stand up because he only stood for the audience of one. He was God-possessed. He was God-purchased. He was living for a purpose even though nobody else was in society. There was trouble outside. There was trouble inside. There was trouble in the home. But he was holding himself together because he was God-possessed. And then Hannah got even more passionate, so passionate. See, this is in verse 12. It begins, as she prayed before the Lord, Eli watched, watched her mouth. Now Hannah, verse 13, spoke in her heart, uh, sorry, spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. And Eli thought she was drunk, of course, a few more scriptures, and she explains herself. She says to Eli, she says, No, my Lord, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. I pour it out. See, she's not just a little dabble, do you? I have an extra little two minutes here. She has got to a position. She didn't care who was around here. She didn't care what was going on. She got down on her knees. She might have got down on her face, but tears began to come out. Something was coming out of the inside of her. She was digging deep. She was going for the well. She was drawing on some water. She was throwing down the bucket and trying to pull up everything she has. She says, man, I've got to get an answer on this. i got to get a breakthrough. There ain't nobody that can fix it. My husband cannot fix it. My children cannot fix it. That other crazy woman in the house cannot fix it. My pastor cannot fix it. Come on, somebody. The government cannot fix it. I've got to go deep. i got to drop the bucket deep. i got to pull out some deep water. And she got in there. And the prophet, uh, sorry, the Eli said to her, woman, you're drunk. She said, no, I've just been pouring. I've just been pouring out my soul. I've been dropping the bucket deep and pulling out deep, you know. And all of a sudden, you know, one of the remaining sparks of what you see in this fat and blind priest by the name of Eli said, go in peace. The God of Israel grant you your petition. When she said, when he said, excuse me, the God of Israel, that is the God of Jacob. That's what happened to Jacob before he became Israel, the God of Israel. You know, it was Jacob. Jacob had an encounter in Genesis 32, and that's where his name was turned from Jacob to Israel, the God of the turnaround, the God of the blessing, the God of the breakthrough. Come on, somebody. God's gonna turn it around in the midnight hour. Come on, somebody. And around, and around, and around, around, around. But here's the picture that I want you to see. Men, you listen to me. You do make a difference in your family. And you better start making a difference in your family. I don't say that as a threat. I say that as an encouragement. Well, you know, she's not all in there. Well, you just be in there. Well, she's not all that and all for God. Well, you just be in there and be all for God. You know, it's time you start living like Elkanah. It's time like you start saying, my example is going to make a difference. There is going to be a divine appointment in my family. God is going to show up. Going to church is the right thing to do. I'm not going to let my kids live any way they want to live. I'm not going to let people just do any kind of immoral thing in my household. No, you're going to shut that off. You're going to turn that down. We're not going to listen to that stuff because we are the garters of the citadel that God has given us called our abode, our home and it's time that the man of God, the woman of God began to stand up and stand out and let God do what only God can do. Fix it. 
He's going to fix it. I said, he's going to fix it. He's going to fix you. He's going to fix them. He's going to fix your children. He's going to fix your family. He's going to fix your city. He's going to fix everything that's broken because there are times that it only goes from bad to worse unless God gets in there and fixes it. Come on, somebody. Oh, you might be seated. You know, the, it's a beautiful story, brother and sister. Wish I had time to share it with you. But the key to Hannah's story is a God-possessed man. A God-purchased man. A God-possessed man who would not give up because of trouble. Who would not give up because of difficulty because he was born for such a time as this. So as you well know the story, here's the equation up to now. Now, there was a God-possessed man for, for years, to be quite honest. And even though Hannah, that other one, were in the house, Hannah did not make a decision until a while, but I can guarantee you that man had an influence on her. So now there's a God-possessed man, there's a God-possessed woman, and they have a God-possessed child. And that child is who? Samuel. I'm talking about the Samuel generation. Now I want you to understand what this is all about here. And God raised up a Samuel. And God used Samuel to anoint whom? David. Poured oil on David. And anointed David as king of Israel. Uh-oh, something's coming back now. Something's coming back. Something's coming back now. Something's coming back. You know, so now Israel gets a king. And now they start getting order. And now they started getting focused. And now there is a godly authority in the land with a king with a new anointing because of Samuel, because he had a God-possessed mother and a God-possessed father. You see what I'm saying? And the Bible says that the presence of God came back to Shiloh. My God. Came back to Shiloh. The presence of God came back. You want the presence of God back in your family? You want the presence of God back on your life? You want the presence of God back on whatever it is you're doing, your children? I'm here to tell you, just get God possessed. There's something about the anointing of God. There's something about the anointing of God. There's something about when you look around, you say, like, it doesn't seem like the environment to praise God because there's trouble on the rep. There's trouble on the left. There's trouble in the middle. There's trouble above me. There's trouble underneath me. There's trouble in my past. And it looks like there's trouble in the future. But you got to remind yourself that you didn't just come into this world. The day you were born again, you were born again. You got God purchased. You got God possessed. Whether you're a man or you're a woman, I'm here to tell you, God is raising you up to bring the anointing back to the house of God, to bring the anointing back to our cities, to bring the anointing back to our communities. God is is looking for you. Give the Lord a great big hand clap right there. So a God-possessed man shows up. A God-possessed woman all of a sudden shows up. Now the story of Hannah begins. Now we can start the story of Hannah. Everybody always talks about Hannah, but there's no, there's no, Elkanah, oh yeah, yeah, that's just her husband. Who you didn't have it in context or environment. Just saying. It would do you well to read your Bible. You see, he shows up in a generation that's defiled on the outside. It's wicked on the inside, and it's dysfunctional in the home. If God's going to fix anything, he's going to do it with the anointing. Yeah, that's what he's going to do. So what, what is God's answer? God's answer is to get God-possessed families. And it all starts with you, Dad. It all starts with you. Come on. Say, it starts with the dad. You know, we try so many things in life, don't we? You know, we, what we need to understand is we just need to get God possessed. Not self-possessed. Not worldly possessed. Not money possessed. Not career possessed. Not title possessed. Not lust possessed. Woo, there are a lot of people in the church that are pissed by everything but God. <laughs> They show up to church, they're possessed by all kinds of stuff. Check their calendar. Check their checkbook. You'll find out where their commitment is. I can't tithe, but I have to go out and buy this. Anyways, uh, see, God just needs somebody. He just needs one. One God-possessed man or woman 
to step up in our school system. Let's just say, as one example. One God-possessed man. One God-possessed woman. One God-possessed husband. One God-possessed wife. One God-possessed family. What about one God-possessed millennial? What about one God-possessed college student? What about one God-possessed you? What about you? So here I want to share with you this story. Hang with me now because the best is yet to come. Here's a story. I want to share a story. I don't know if he's here. I'll, give him, I'll talk to him afterward. But there's a young man comes to our church, and his name is Adam Frost. And Adam was lost as a goose in a hailstorm. And I want you to realize, but there was somebody in his life, a God-possessed woman by the name of Samantha DeCourt. And she was God-possessed. But something happened to Adam. Something happened to Adam. This is the power of influence, the power of massive impact. Because someone stepped into that was God-possessed in Samantha's life way back. Samantha made a decision, not just for Adam, but for many others, to step into her brother's life. Adam Frost. And Adam shares this amazing story of his transformation and what a beautiful story it is. Not only of the story of where he came from, but how God possessed him and how he became a father of a God-possessed child. Watch his story. And while growing up, you know, I was barely even a teenager, and my life already started taking a turn for the worse. You know, growing up with my, me and my brother, you know, living with my mom and dad, um, it was a very toxic environment. You know, there was a lot of drugs, every type of abuse, you know, uh, mental, physical, social, all types of abuse. Me and my brother, we had to fend for ourselves. Yeah, it's like we had parents, but we were the parents, basically cook for ourselves, um, get ready for school. Even if we wanted to go to school, if we didn't, they wouldn't care. Stay home, play games, you know, go out for long hours of the night, come home, hang out on the streets. So at a young age, we knew how to survive. That's really where it impacted us the most. You know, as far as children growing up, kids, they need that attention growing up. And me and my brother, we didn't get that attention. My mom, she, she got mixed up with the wrong crowd. She got mixed up with the wrong people. She was my mom, but we never looked at it that way. There was no relationship because she was there, but she wasn't there. Her and my dad used to fight a lot. My dad hit her, but she would hit him. You know, very, very abusive uh, marriage. And me and my brother would be seeing all of this taking place in the home. You know, my mom, she would get caught up in these wrong, with these wrong people that led her to, you know, um, losing her life when I was very young. When my mom passed away, I had a lot of anger and resentment against her. She wasn't there for us. I took everything that, that I said to my mom, everything that I seen in that house, and I, and I held it against myself. What happened in our home, I, I, I looked at every other home according to that, according to that lifestyle. I was so traumatized that every home's gonna be like this. Always a broken home to me. There's no such thing as a good home. It, caused me to look at life in a darker way and just having hate towards everybody. My dad ended up living in his van. The house thing didn't work. Me and my brother would, would walk around being Kanyoi and on the streets, you know, it was bad. The drugs, of course, was a factor. We drank a lot. We did, I did harder drugs. I was just more of, let's get high. Yeah, let's get drunk. And I want to cover up this pain that I'm feeling that I went through. But at the, at the same time, I'm going through this. My family, yeah, my family, they're there. And every time I see my sister, she's always praying for me. She picks me up and she, she buys me something to eat. And she continues to minister to me. And I, I don't even know it at this time. She's sowing seeds into my life. My sister's house was always available. She, she wanted us there. Yeah, she would always look for me and she would, she would really search for me. She would spend all hours of the night staying up crying. She would come out one o'clock in the morning and look for me all over Kanyoi and, and asking people, oh, um, did you see Adam? Did you see Adam? And, and at times she would find me, but a lot of times she wouldn't. You know, that kind of, that stuck with me. You know, what, what I put my family through. But again, there was something deeper you know, that only God could, could find. 
this is what people don't see. Yeah, they see the person doing drugs, they see the drug addict and the, the homeless on the street, but for me, there was a lot of thoughts of suicide. Why am I even going through this? Why is my family suffering because of the selfish decisions that I'm making? I can end it right now. Regardless of everything that I was going through, living on the streets, homeless, the drug, drug activity, being addicted. My daughter was born 2010. It, it gave me hope. In that moment, when she was born, while my, you know, her mom is lying down on the bed holding her, I remember me being in the bathroom and writing, writing a letter. It was a letter of, to, to end my life, suicide. That just that victim mentality, you know, just, man, just that pity, that pity role that I, that just, I continue to play. I'm in no position to take care my daughter, I can't even take care of myself, and I'm in the bathroom just crying. I'm just like, man, is this what it really is? You know, is this, is where, is this where I'm at? In all these times that has taken place, all these traumatic events that I'm sharing with you, I'm not even realizing that God is moving over in my life. He was there. It still didn't register. Something wasn't, it just didn't click. But still, from there, it just continued to, um, to get worse. I am just completely broken. I'm at the lowest point in my life. So 2017, I come up to this park. This is where I spend most of my time. The people I would hang around with, associate with, we would end up there. This boy comes up. He looks young. He looks 16, 17 years old. He says, oh, can I, can I buy something? And he's looking for drugs, right? My mind is just, is just blown already at this point. I, I end up selling to him. I get this funny feeling that, man, I think I just did something wrong. Before you know it, a hand comes right from the side. It grabs my hand like this, and it's a cop. They end up arresting me that day. They take me to cell block. The detective comes, yeah. You know, you're looking at some serious charges. You're gonna be looking at five to 10 years minimum. You're gonna be facing five to 10 years. That's when something hit me. That's when my daughter being born, my sister reaching out to me, praying for me, everything hit me in that one moment. And I said, man, Adam, this is what it brought you to. You're gonna be missing out five to 10 years on your life. You're gonna, this is a serious point now. It's not a game anymore, Adam. It's not just you getting high and doing what you wanna do. You're gonna be gone for that amount of time. Your, your daughter's gonna grow up without you. Your sister, they're not gonna be able to see you anymore. Something hit me, yeah, something very, something happened and I ended up getting on my knees. In cell block was only me and I just said a very simple prayer. I just, but I, it was sincere. And I said, Lord, if there's a life to live, I know this is not it. But if you show me what that life is, I will do whatever it takes to serve you. And if you're real, please make yourself known to me right now because I need you right now. After that simple prayer, something changed. Something, something happened in that cell block and my life changed in that moment. It changed around. Well, in the next four months while I was incarcerated, man, God just really put a fire in my heart to continue to keep my promise to Him, to really take it seriously and to know that Whatever I was going gonna go through, that it's gonna be all for him. I got two months in. The public defender that they assigned to me, he comes in. He wants to get me into a, a treatment. He wants to get me out. And this is all God at this point. I'm already looking at my charges, five to 10 years, and this don't make sense to me. You know, and these are hard charges. And he says, somebody accepted you, a Christian-centered home. They ended up pulling me out. Um, they take me to the west side. It's a church home. Yeah, and they have church. And I remember, I said to God, if you help me, if you help me now, I'll do whatever it takes to serve you. So right there, I ended up um, getting into Bible studies. I ended up leading Bible studies. In that process, God is still restoring my past. Everything that I've lost, He's bringing it back to me, and He's restoring it. So I end up getting my GED. So now I'm in college, I'm at my third year. And at this point, um, my sister, she intervenes in my life. So she comes back in my life and she was there. She was there with me, guiding me through this home and the process. She says, oh, you should come live with me now. This home, you did what you needed to do. And now you should 
you should step out and uh, come live with us. So I end up moving with my sister, Samantha. And if we know my sister, she's all about this vision. You know, she's all about serving God. She says, okay, we gotta get you planted. We're gonna take you back to Word of Life. We're gonna get you back, we're gonna get you connected. That Sunday, while I'm walking, we're, we're almost to the ramp. Who's now my life group leader? I see Sean Wella. And she introduces us. And right there, I made that decision to make him my life group leader. He really took me in as, an old, as a younger brother under his wing. He's been raising me up. He's been sowing seeds into my life. He's been encouraging me in ways that I need for my life. Sean would always call me up in the morning. He said, bro, did you do your devotions? He would get out of his comfort zone. He would come to meet up with me and we would talk about God. And so from there, he built me up to be a 144. So today, I'm a 144 leader. I have my, my own life group. I have it every Thursdays. And God has just been blessing me. I'm realizing that from that cell block, God has brought me all the way to this point to where this is my home church, is Word of Life. This is where the vision that I'm supposed to be connected to. Today, for the first time in over 20 years, me and my dad, God blessed us with our own place. Not only do we have each other to, to have a place to live in, but we have a place to praise God in. And today, you know, he's really, he's lifted up that, that resentment that I had against my mom. You know, and this is over 20 years later. He's taken that away. Yeah, he's removed that, that stony heart and he's given me a heart of flesh. Today, I have my daughter back in my life. We're gonna be a family that serves God a family on fire for Him. We're gonna do whatever it takes to, to win souls and make disciples. There were arguments in my life where it kept me in that wilderness. I believed those arguments. I let those foxes spoil the vine. Yeah, and those were all lies. You can't get too far to where God can't reach you. He can reach anyone. He changed my story and not only my story, but He changed my, my families and generations to come. God changed my story. can do to let you down it doesn't take a trophy to make you proud I'll never be more loved than I am right now going through a storm but I won't go down I hear you So I wouldn't drown You've never been closer than you are right now You are Shira You are enough Shira Shira You are enough I will be I will be close
before you with a heart of thanksgiving. Adam, I know you're here somewhere. I know you're serving Adam Frost. What a powerful story. Wow. What a powerful story. I feel honored to be in that man's presence. And that song right there, shoot. How could God not be enough? I'm here to tell you. I said, Lord, in Adam's life, and I say thank you to you, Adam. You took the challenge. You allow God to possess you, purchase you, restore you. What a beautiful miracle. Gosh. And uh, I said, Lord, and look, you've given me the privilege stand next to him to call him part of this house I said Lord I'm the honored one I'm the honored one I want to pray for you fathers and again I want to thank uh, before I forget Josh and Kale for being with us I want to thank Ikaika gosh Ikaika you almost are getting to my level and then Josh right oh I love your fro bro I told him the other day that is me in the 70s. Yeah, yeah, y'all have no ideas. One of these days, I'll pull it out. 
but nobody pull it out without my permission until I'm ready. I had a fro. I don't think I can. No, bro. I tell you, I would float. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it. Love you, men, being here. Women that are here. All of you that are here. Fathers online here. Wow, what an honor. Pastor Stan, thank you so much for bringing your men. Pastor Henry, thank you for encouraging them. Come from Kona. Pastor Scott and Darlene from Malu. Pastor Fika from West Oahu. Did I forget anybody? I probably did. Anyways, and uh, but all the G12 men, but I want to just pray for you, you fathers, as we close off. You know what? Sometimes there's really not much I can say. You know, just just take the challenge. Allow yourself to be God possessed. Realize that God has placed you in that relationship or in that family for a purpose, not to fit in, but to stand out. Not to be rude or manipulative or dominate or, you know, but simply to be that God-possessed man. Men, remember how Ekana just loved on Hannah. Loved on Hannah through her trouble. Love your children. Love your wives or that significant other right now. You know, wherever, love them. Show that you're God-possessed. Show that God character. God will do the rest. God will do it. Father, I pray for every father online and every father in person, single or married, it makes no difference. Lord, we're so inspired by your miracle hand and, and Adam Frost's life, his vulnerability, gosh, Lord, his just openness to just to share. Lord, there's no man that can take glory. No church can take glory for that, what you have done. It's what you have done. Lord, I thank you that you were able to speak to him in a very difficult time, in a time of trouble. And you looked down from heaven and you saw a man that was desperate. You saw a man that had a daughter. You saw a man whose life was out of control like sometimes we fathers all feel like. And your eyes caught us. Can you say, I, I can use that? I can work with that. And like you found Adam, you find us today, whether online or here in person. We only pray that our hearts would be open enough, Father God, to, to receive all the goodness, certainly all your mercy, certainly the grace that you work in us. Lord, we're, we're privileged to stand before the audience of one. Thank you that on this Father's Day, with that one story, with of course your word, more importantly, your Lordship, and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You've brought all fathers and all men encouragement. As Adam said that, Lord, you are restoring. You can do that so far beyond our imagination when there's no evidence of what you can bring back together and put back together. Sometimes we don't feel it. Sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes people say around us, it's never going to happen. But then there's that one word, God, that God factor. And so, Lord, I pray that you would possess our hearts as we reconsecrate our lives to you again. Bless these fathers. Bless their families. Bless their mindsets, their perspective, how they see themselves, how they carry themselves. No burdens, no condemnation, no guilt, no shame. Father, we're just making a decision today to walk God purchased, God possessed for your glory and nothing else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Come on. Give Adam a great big hand clap too. He's somewhere here. Turn up the lights. Adam, where are you, Adam? Are you somewhere in the house? Where is he? Is he waving his hand? Someone told me he was working out here. Anyway, where is he? Adam, where are you? Wave your hand. Come on, son. Awesome. Adam, come over here real quick, 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 quick. Adam, come. Run like you have PF Flyers. No, run like you have Nikes. If you don't run, it's because you wear Adidas. Adam, love you, son. Jump up here. Come here, can you come over here? This is Adam Frost right here. Walking miracle. He gives, all, he gives all the glory. He gives all the glory. He gives all the glory to God. You know, that's amazing. And uh, I just want to thank you for sharing your story. So, uh, yeah, and 
Adam will be <laughs> sorry, you make me emotional, Adam. <laughs> yeah, because you know what? I get to stand next to a miracle. You know, listen, some of you men might have forgot where you came out of. Maybe there was a day that you were pulled out of the miry clay, but you forgot what it was like. God just reminded me of just his mercy and his goodness, his faithfulness. And so uh, here's Adam. And I know there's many, many testimonies that are here, and I'm very thankful for every one of you. But maybe before you leave, just come up and shake Adam's hand. He'll be right down here. He's not looking for applause. He's not looking for attention. But he's just here to give all the glory to God. I love you, son. Hey. God bless you. Aloha. Shalom.